today for the worship service at Calvary Road Baptist Church. Our desire is to equip believers to become fully devoted followers of Christ. Calvary Road has a dynamic ministry committed to worshiping God, loving others, serving others, and inviting others. Have you here this morning, and we are just delighted to again be in God's house and worshiping Him in spirit and truth, and we hope that you feel welcome this morning. We're glad that you're here, and uh, we want to extend a warm invitation to those who are tuning in by way of internet this morning. Uh, perhaps they're watching from home, maybe not necessarily uh, feeling quite comfortable enough yet to come venture out, but we are glad that you are here in the sanctuary with us and tuning in by way of internet also. And so we say welcome. It's just good to be in God's house this morning. Amen. With all the things that are going on in the world around us, the hope that we have in Christ is uh, is enough to get us through, amen, is to just focus on Him and uh, keep our affections set on Him, and uh, it's just good for God's people to be able to come together and to worship Him, and I trust that that's why you're here this morning. I trust that that's why your family is tuning in this morning. I trust that it's because you want to draw closer to the King of Kings and to the Lord of Lords because He longs to have a personal and intimate relationship with each one of us. And I pray that that's what is accomplished here this morning on all of our, uh, on all of our halves. So we appreciate you being here. And I uh, want, if you will, to join with me as we go to the Lord for a time of prayer this morning. Father, thank you so much for a beautiful day that you've given us. Even with the unrest that we see in the world around us, the child of God this morning can have a deep, deep settled peace, knowing that you are King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And we can rest in the truth that we belong to you today. So no matter what takes place in this world around us, we can cling tightly to the relationship that we have with you, knowing that this world is not our home, that we are here but just for a little while, and when our time comes, whether that be through death or through the rapture, uh, Father, we're going to spend all of eternity with you, and we look forward to that time. But Father, as we wait here below, may we be faithful in gathering together in your name, to worship you in spirit and truth. And Father, I pray today that you would encourage us, that you would strengthen us, that we would find the help that we need. Our help comes from you. Lord, bless our time of fellowship. Bless our time of worship. Bless our time of studying your word this morning. We pray this in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. Well, good morning to you. The psalmist David said, Let us go into the house of the Lord and worship Him. The prophet Isaiah said, Sing to the Lord, for He has done glorious things. Let this be known to all the world. Shout aloud and sing for joy, people of Zion, for great is our Holy One of Israel among you. Are you excited to be in the house of the Lord? Amen. We're going to ask you to stand as we sing together. We've come into this house and gathered in his name to worship him. Oh, 
this morning as we go into a time of prayer and uh, so many needs. You brought your own in here, I'm sure. We all have one, some special object that's on our heart this morning. As a nation, we're, we're in a mess. And this week has been filled with new surprises and really things that's not surprising. And uh, we're beating each other up in our own streets. It's heartbreaking. And it's heartbreaking to watch what we've been told for years would come. And we're living in those days. Perilous times when men are lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Seeking their own way. So this morning we have much to pray about. But not just nationally, but as individuals. You have something going on in your life that you just need a touch from the Master. And so as we get ready to inch our way forward toward the preaching, we just sang about being in His presence while we're there, while we're in His presence. Nothing greater than we talk to Him. We didn't come to church to to just see each other. With technology, we can do that on FaceTime. We came to church to worship the King of Kings today. And those of you that are gathered now around your computer or wherever you're at, whatever day you even watch this, take this time right now as we bow in His presence and give you ample time to talk to Jesus. Give you time to thank Him. Maybe you don't have anything to ask Him. Maybe it's just that He's been so good to you that you just want to thank Him. And I tell you what, we got up this morning, so we ought to thank Him. We're, we're here today, we ought to thank Him. Our nation's in a mess, but it's still the greatest nation to be living in. And we ought to thank Him that we get to live here. What a God. He put food on our tables. He's put clothes on our backs. We got people around us that love us. And whether we're online or in the building, we're together. We're still family. The Bible says in Psalm 61, Hear my cry, O God, attend unto my prayer. From the end of the earth will I cry unto thee. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. This morning, we need God's help. We need Him in our nation. We need Him in our families. They say this virus don't like the heat. Well, thank God it's as hot as it is. And let's thank Him for the heat. Because I can't think of anything greater than to fill this building and fill this choir loft. And, and we're finally over our fears and we're worshiping the King again. We don't know what to do in here this morning, do we? Do we touch each other? The little dances we do around in here look like honeybees in a hive. Let's just ask God to end this thing. He's still God. He can end this today. Suddenly this virus is gone. God's people be back together. And isn't it fascinating, church, that since God's people have not been together, look at the hell that's been unleashed on this nation and on this planet. There's a strength when God's people come together, when we cry out together. Take a few minutes, make an altar where you're at, Come to the altar if you want to. You can be seated if you can't stand no more. That's fine. God hears you seated, laying down. I've noticed He hears us driving, mowing. Thank God He hears us everywhere. Let's cry out to Him.
we continue in a season of prayer this morning. I'm so glad that Pastor John read Psalm 61. I'm thankful that when our hearts are overwhelmed, there's the comforting peace that comes in knowing Jesus. Before we pray, I want to share something that happened yesterday. I talked to Pastor John on the way back. My family and I had went on a little camping trip this weekend. and First day that we were there, we went down to the lake to go swim. For all the parents in here, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. There's always a fear that something's going to happen to your kids. You, it's just something that comes with being a parent. My daughter's a great swimmer. She has been for some time, but she's never swam in a lake before. She jumped in an area that was probably a little bit too deep for her. and She began to panic. She couldn't swim. All of a sudden, her fear paralyzed her. And all she could do in that moment was cry out for her daddy. I really believe that when our heart is overwhelmed, the greatest thing that we can ever do is to call out to our daddy, our heavenly father. So I don't know what you're going through this morning. But I can promise you this. Just as in that situation at the lake with my daughter, I jumped in and rescued her. I know that my Heavenly Father is far more capable than I can ever be. So with whatever it is that you're facing today, I want you to know that God is able. When we look at a world that's stricken with sin and it is in complete unrest, the greatest thing, the greatest privilege that we have as children of God is to cry out to our Daddy in Heaven. He loves us. cares greatly for us. So will you join me this morning as we cry out to our Father. Father, today, I'm thankful that when my heart is overwhelmed, I can cry out to You, my Father in Heaven. And I can find hope, I can find peace, I can find comfort for whatever life throws at me. Father, today, I just want to simply take a moment and say thank you. Thank you for all that you've done for me. Father, you've been so good to me and to my family. Father, I I ask for your forgiveness because so often I've just taken those blessings for granted. And you've reminded me afresh and anew just how much you've given me. So Father, with all of us here in this room this morning, I know that your blessings have been bestowed on on all of us in some form or some fashion. And maybe right now for the remainder of this prayer time, Father, what we want to do is just simply say thank you. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your intervention in our lives in so many ways. Thank you for the smallest of details being taken care of. 
Father, we're grateful. Oh, we're so very grateful for all the major things in our lives that you've taken care of. But, but God, I'm so thankful that you take care of us even down to the smallest of details. Your grace is sufficient. Though thousands have drawn from it, it has never diminished one iota. And God, for that today, we say thank you. Although our hearts can so easily become overwhelmed, my prayer is this morning that as we continue in this time of worship, that our hearts would be comforted and filled and flooded with the joy of knowing Jesus. We love you today, Lord. Thank you for loving us. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. You may
believe what he says about you, not what others say or think. We must believe what he says. Take your Bibles, turn to the book of Isaiah. Boy, did God put a pack of dynamite in such a little body and voice that comes out of that. Isn't that amazing? Uh, when she cheers and I'm sitting in the press box, I can hear her over everybody else. She's got that power pack inside. Isaiah chapter 1, if you will turn there, we're going to continue on the theme of worship. And because uh, it's been a theme that God has had me in throughout this whole thing, through the weeks that we were not together and separated, uh, not being in the building, and some of us still are separated and not been able to come back yet. Um, my heart really got on, what exactly are we doing? And why do we do what we do? When I came here 13 years ago, this was the text I preached on that Sunday 13 years ago. But boy, is it altogether different this morning. Things have really changed in 13 years. And changing so rapidly. When you read the book of Isaiah, you are amazed that it would almost seem that Isaiah is writing on a street corner in America in 2020. And this morning, the question for us is to think about and ponder on as we go through the text is to what purpose? What are we doing? And why do we do it? Or maybe we think of it this way. What have we been doing? And why did we do it? I wonder how much time we wasted on trivial pursuits. How much time did we spend awake over things that will never matter? And how many opportunities in our lifetime have we had to worship in spirit and in truth? And we missed it. We miss the worship because of worry. We miss the awesomeness because of anxiety. We came in and we missed the majesty because of materialism. We can't focus. We can't focus on the Father. That's the devil's playground is our mind. Your mind's a battlefield. My mind is a battlefield. And we struggle to keep our attention where our attention needs to be. And if you ask my opinion that through the years, many years, not just the last few years, but over time, over many years, the devil did a tremendous job of getting the church off of its task. Somehow we became building-oriented. Somehow we became focused on programs and agendas, and we became this structured uh, organism that, man, it run well, the machine run well. But in the whole thing, we missed God. In the whole thing, we would leave church and think of your Sunday conversations. Was it about what God had just done for you? Was it about what you had felt in the building together with the people of God? Or did we leave and say, I wonder what the temperature was set on. Or I wonder why did they do that? Or how come they're changing the music like that? Or, or what was it about the sound? You see how the devil gets in our minds and he starts messing with us? When I leave ball games, I remember details. I remember a play. I can remember a specific play watching a game and tell you what quarter that was in. I can go back in North Carolina basketball history and tell you who they were playing, where they were at. I remember details. How much worship detail do you remember? How many services stick out in your mind? Because maybe we've gone through a ritual. And then you have to question this. In the ritual of worship, the traditional way of just coming in and doing our little thing, how did that make God feel? 
And is it possible that God just turned away from it? And while we thought we were doing something so pleasing, he turned his head away from it. Because it wasn't authentic. It wasn't from here. It was just a structured way of doing things. We talked a few weeks ago about we've worked ourselves out of enjoying worship. We're, we're coming to church out of obligation. Our name has been signed up and we come because we have a little place of service that we come to. We're supposed to be in the parking lot, the nursery, the we worship. We're supposed to be an usher. We're supposed to do this. It's time for my Sunday to keep the nursery. How exciting was that, that you got to go to the house of God to be thrown up on? And all those things are important. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that what you did was not wonderful. But in all of that, we missed God. And we have people that are tired and weary. And if there's one thing that God's been working on is, I think we need to rethink church. I think we need to rethink what we've been doing. And wouldn't it be just like God to clean the house out, get rid of everybody, not let us come together so we could stop and think about what we're doing and how we're doing it. He couldn't get us to listen any other way. He couldn't get our attention any other way, so what he did was throw us out. I won't let you go for a little while. And then I want my men to sit down and listen to me while I pump into them some things that I'd like to see done a little different. And in Isaiah chapter 1, you just start going into these verses. I want you to look with me in verse 10. And this morning, I'm just going to walk my way through the verses and give you some stuff. Let's listen to verse 10 and 11 and 12 and listen to what they say. Hear the word of the Lord. Do you know that's what you're supposed to come for? If you come to church to sleep, you should have stayed home, right? And I think about how many sleepy Christians in the years. And if you're that tired, get your rest and then come to church. And then think about this. Hear the word of the Lord. That You will be held accountable whether you heard the word or not. Do you know, you think about we're going to be held accountable for this? This service and what God wanted to say to us? Not me. I wouldn't listen to me either. Listen to what he calls Israel. Ye rulers of Sodom. That's what God tells them. That's, that's the way you're acting. He was not doing them a favor here. He said, hear the word of the Lord, ye rulers of Sodom. Give ear to the law of our God, you people of Gomorrah. And here's where we get our title. To what purpose? What are you doing? What's the reason? The multitude of your sacrifices to me, saith the Lord. I am full of the burnt offerings. You know what he's saying? I'm, I'm up, it's up to here now. I'm sick of it. I'm full of your burnt offerings. What would we call that? I'm, I'm full of your whatever it is you've been doing. I've, I'm full of it. You come in and the sound and the lights and the, the show, is it's incredible. But I'm, I'm just full of it because you left me out. In the process of trying to make the four-part harmony be perfect. In the process of trying to bring the house down with the show. You forgot me. And I'm just sick of it. And listen to what he goes on to say. I'm full of the burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts. And I delight not in the blood of bullocks or of lambs or of he goats. Now y'all remember this is the way they went to the temple. They brought their sacrifices. They, they, did they bring it because they loved him? Did they bring it with him at the forefront of their mind? This is what he said. You're just doing it out of ritual. You're just doing it because you've always done it. When we were kids, we used to go in the bedroom and play church. We had somebody lead the music. We'd always have somebody take an offering. We'd have somebody do a little praying and then somebody do a little preaching. And I can remember we'd come home after church and we would have somebody in our choir that, boy, when they'd rear back and sing, uh, she would sing and you, we all knew who it was. And so we'd have somebody play her. And, and when she sung, she'd lean back and sing. So we'd lean back and we knew the actions of preachers and we knew how to do it. 
And kids mimic what we do. They mimic what they see their parents doing. That's thought provoking, isn't it? And God says, you're bringing your sacrifices. Wonder why? Because your parents did. You know how to do church. But what you don't know how to do is to worship me. So what's been your purpose in all that you're doing? It says in verse 12, when you come to appear before me, who hath required this at your hand to tread my courts? In all honesty, they were very sick spiritually. And God is filled up to sickness in his own heart with what he's been watching. Their religious services had become an abomination. The only thing that's holding the nation together was a remnant of people, faithful people. I think that sounds like us today. There was unrest on every street corner. People were satisfied with seeking their own way. And doesn't this sound just like our day? Then we see an amazing scene unfold. These people have been blessed by God in wonderful ways. I'm not saying all of our services were sickening. I think every now and then we tapped in just a little bit to what God wanted us to get. I think every now and then we'd do something and God would say, yes, how refreshing is that? That was real. That was not rehearsed. That wasn't part of the show. Every now and then somebody would leave their seat and come to the altar in the middle of church. They didn't have to wait for an invitation, but... It was just between them and God. And God would, I think, stand up in heaven and say, Yes, that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for authenticity. I'm not looking for people that just sit there and go through the motions of church. I think we've been made to feel like that, that this is a way you have to worship. We've been told a way. There's a Baptist way, a Methodist way, a Presbyterian way. There's liturgical worship where... They say something and you repeat it back and there's quiet worship. And some churches are, they get flat out of hand. You know what I mean? They wave their hands and almost do cartwheels. But here's the problem. They do that every week. And it's not like that every week. Every week you're not going to want to do cartwheels. Every week you're not going through the same thing. Sometimes you want to come in shouting because of what he's brought you through. I mean, you can't help to think that Mark this morning is overwhelmed because yesterday he happened to be in the right place when his daughter was sinking. So he's going to come into worship a little different today than maybe somebody else. Maybe you had one of those weeks where nothing worked for you and you just needed to come and rest in his presence and understand it's going to be okay. See? We cannot manufacture worship. It's got to come from your heart. Sometimes you don't want to shout. You just cry. Sometimes you just, you get more out of a song than you do a message. Don't amen that. Sometimes you, you get more out of something that was said in a prayer than you did through the rest of the service. And sometimes you came in the building and it was just somebody loved on you. And God, through that hug, which... The devil's trying to take away from us. But God, through that touch, did something for you that let you know, you know, they do care. They do care. Israel should have been seeking God in the shape they were in, but instead of Israel seeking God, God had to seek them out. Don't that sound like maybe what's happening? The Bible says to every season, there's a purpose to every time. There's a purpose. Mark whispered this in my ear over here. He said that verse. To everything there's a purpose. That means coronavirus has a purpose. And maybe God has shook the church and sifted the church. And God is saying, let the real church stand up. Let's stop playing. Stop your rituals. Stop coming out of obligation. Stop dragging your little sacrifice in and saying, well, you know what? I better go so God sees me. Tim Allen says that on home improvement. 
Why do you go to church? Because I get extra credit. And if you stay awake, you get extra credit. And if you sing the songs, you get extra credit. Maybe that's our viewpoint of God. What a terrible viewpoint. God just wants you. He just wants you. Hey, parents, you ever watched your kids do something out of obligation? Lips dragging the ground, mad you asked them. Oh, they'll do it because they don't want to die. They want to live there. But you say, go do this. Go clean your room. Boy, they sulk and they do something. Now, let me ask you something. Doesn't it feel entirely different when you turn the corner and they just made the bed without you asking? I mean, it'll happen at least maybe twice in all their years. Maybe twice. And you're in shock. And then the first question out of your mouth is, what do you want? What do you want? But it's a whole different feeling, isn't it? Because they did it, not out of obligation, but they just did it. They did it maybe because they loved you. That's why I think we love Mother's Day and Father's Day so much. It's because they come up with some creative way of telling you that they love you. It didn't have to be massive. Maybe that's what God's looking for out of us when we come to church. Maybe that's what God's looking for out of us when we open His Word. Let's open His Word, not out of obligation, but because we want to. Don't do a devotion because the preacher guilted you into it. Do a devotion because you really want to hear from God. And, and, and don't come to church because you got signed up to do something. I think we ought to do away with all the doing something. Y'all have no idea where we're headed. You don't have any, I don't either. Buckle up. Wonder what it'll look like a year from now. I have not a clue, and it may be an ever changing thing, but what we're not going to do is we're not going back to what we used to be. Tired and weary people who come to church to get through it. Let's just come and sit in his presence. And, and, and God sought them out. Isn't it like a loving God to say, I've had enough? Because he loves them, he tells them. Instead of just raining down on them with fire and brimstone, he gives them an opportunity to make things right. Wouldn't it be just like a loving God to say, Okay, church, I've had enough. I'm going to take you out of the buildings. I'm going to separate you. You're going to have to sit at home. And then you're going to have to make choices. You've got to make choices if you want to meet with me. You're going to have to decide if you want me or not. You have to decide whether the church was important to you or not. And your devotional time with your family is important to you. You're going to have to decide about your priorities. So I'm not just preaching to you, I'm preaching to me. I have realized in the last several weeks, my priorities was out of whack. Even as a pastor, how out of whack my priorities were. Twenty-some years, I told you this a few weeks ago, but in the interrogation, that's our first point, is God's interrogation. So let's let God call us in. In those three verses, we see God's interrogation. I don't want you to be uh, scared of this, but He's calling us in today. Let Him call you in. Let Him question you. Like going into the courtroom. Church family, Calvary Road, let Him question us. What have you been doing? Why have you been doing it? What have you been getting out of it? Where are you in your walk with me? You brought your sacrifices. You drug your little lambs, he said. You drug the bullocks in. You did all of that. The blood was spilt. But where was I in all of that? How is it that you could go through that service and never think of me? How is it that when we sit in church and somebody raises their hand, we look at them like they have leprosy? Maybe it's because we don't understand why they would do that. Because we hadn't felt that. Why is it when somebody's weeping in church, we think they've got a real problem? Maybe they just love God. Right? It's not wrong if somebody wants to sing loud. It's not wrong if somebody wants to lift both hands. It's not wrong if they just want to fall on their knees. It's not wrong if we want to cry. There's no right way to do this or wrong way to do this. And some people show no emotion. And that's not wrong either. That's just, that's just the way they're built. It's all right. I mean, there's some people who can't help it. You can't judge what's going on in somebody's heart just by looking at them. So here's where God's wanting to know from you. 
It's not what you've done or how you've done it. He's wanting to know about your heart. Where's the authenticity there? See, the nation of Israel has been called to the witness stand. And, and God is standing there interrogating them. They were seeking to substitute sacrifices for obedience to God. And God called them out. Church, to what purpose are we here? And I'm not just talking about just our worship, but Calvary Road, we've been established. We are a church of the living God, and He wants us to be doing something. There's something He wants us to be doing, not just our worship. Let me tell you what worship does, what Sunday does, what church does. It gets us ready. It shows us what we need to be doing, and He gives us the arsenal to do it with. We come in here to be equipped. We come in here to be built up. But we need to be impacting the kingdom. We need to make a noise in Haywood County. Calvary Road needs to start rattling the cage a little bit, helping people. We'll see this in a minute. We need to help more. We've been helping, but we can do more. We need to come into this place with Him on our mind and Him on our heart, and we need to say, all right, what can we be doing to impact the kingdom of God more? Not that we haven't been doing that. We have. But now God is saying, let's do more. Let's do more. The nation of Israel had fallen prey to this belief that rituals is what makes people right with God. And hear my heart. There are some of us that believe that just coming to church is what makes us right with God. But if you've been married, you know this, that just because you're in the same bed with her does not mean you're together. You can fight and go to bed. Right? You can, you can be, you can be, there can be a distance even though you're in the same house. There can be a distance. And just because we're in the house of God does not mean that we're with God. Just because that we have done the ritual of coming to church or, or, or logging on now or, or doing our online thing, here's the thing. Are we with Him or not? Have we fallen prey through the years that the ritual is what made us right. See, the people were wrapped up in the process and not investing in the relationship. What I want us to do is to get more concerned about the relationship and less concerned about the process. When you go to churches, it's a process. When we come in, we have everything in line. People in the parking lot to meet you. People in the front doors to greet you. People to hand you a bulletin. People to give you this and give you that. To see your kids off to, to, to whatever the care it is that they needed to be. And then the show started and the, the lights came on and, and the whole production, the process of church started. And I can't tell you the number of times I left and the process was good. Hear me now, the process was good, but the relationship was off. I, I wasn't where I needed to be with God, but I'd been through the process and you couldn't tell because we'd all been through the process. Been to church, been to church. Boy, that was good, wasn't it? That was good. One woman sat through an entire church service one time, met me at the door, shook my hand and told me I was glad I didn't see anybody wearing pants. I'll tell you, I don't know if she's looking hard enough, and I don't care. I'll just tell you, I don't care if you're wearing pants. God did not inspect your dress. He's inspecting your heart. But see, the process in our mind through the years is what were they wearing? And what did they sing? And what version of the Bible did they use? Come on now. And if all of that's messed up, it messes up our process. We can't hear God because we're so wrapped up in the process. We're so wrapped up in the ritual. Just blows our mind when anything gets out of kilter. Just a little bit. My goodness, we about faint. If, if somebody shouts, we nearly faint. Or we call 911. Have we gotten caught up in ritual and in process? Listen to this. The average business executive spends about 60 hours a year on hold on the telephone. <laughs> Isn't that depressing? According to a survey, he or she also spends 32 minutes a day reading and writing unnecessary memos, 128 hours a year, an hour and, a, hour and 12 minutes a day at unnecessary meetings. Somebody say amen. 
Y'all ever sit through an unnecessary meeting? Mary Ann raised her hand. I look back there, Mary Ann's raising her hand. Mark, deal with that. 288 hours a year in unnecessary meetings. Now, I wonder how much time the average Christian spends going through unnecessary rituals. And we miss it. God's more concerned with the condition of our heart. 1 Samuel 15, verse 22. Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. Did you hear that? What does he want more out of you? Your ritual, your sacrifice, or your obedience? And to hearken better, more than the fat of rams. Have we come to a place that we've tried to compensate for our unrighteous lives by performance? I'll overcome my unrighteousness by the performance of my worship. See, the nation was out of bounds with God. But they thought the ritual and the process of what they were doing would overcome that. Listen to me. There is no amount of process or ritual that will cause God to be pleased with you when your heart is not where it's supposed to be. The last several weeks have taught us that God seeks a genuine, authentic, true relationship with Him. He doesn't want some mechanical form of empty worship. I want to ask you guys, how many years have you gone through mechanical worship? How many church services were mechanical? We've all been there. See, God's not wanting our busyness. He wants to bless us. He don't want a show. He wants sincerity. That's what he wants. You know, God don't freak out when the music don't sound just right. That doesn't mess him up. Do you know God is okay even if my grammar's not? Did you know that? Did you know God is okay if you can't sing in tune? It's okay. Look at your neighbor and tell him it was okay. It's okay. It, it, it don't hurt. God's not in the show. God's in sincerity. God's in not in our trivial pursuits. He's in truth. Not our weariness. God's not, he, he's not proud when he looks down and sees that you've wearied yourself. God wants your worship. And some of us have wearied ourselves in work. And we think when we get to heaven, he's going to say, you are the hardest worker I've ever seen in the church. But what we might hear is, because you work so much, you forgot to worship me. And it's not the list of everything you got done. What gets God up off the throne is when he sees his people in tune with him. It's not weariness, it's worship. Listen to what he said, are you tired? Come unto me. Ye that are weary, come to me. Are you tired, guys? Are you tired, not just church tired, but are you tired of all of this? Are you tired of what you're seeing? How many of you are tired of the news? Are you weary by it? Well, we got to come to church. All you that are weary, come unto me. Look what a blessing we get to do. And they're in your home today. Isn't it more refreshing to watch online than it is watching the news? Isn't it more refreshing to have your Bible open? Have your heart open? Isn't that more refreshing? So God's called us to the witness stand and said, I want to know why you're doing what you're doing. Is it just the process? Is it a ritual? Do you really think this is going to get you extra credit in heaven? What did you do with me? What did you do with my son? Did you know I gave my son for you? Did you forget that in all of this, I gave my only son to die a brutal death on a cross so that you could have redemption. Have you forgot that? I mean, today, if you're struggling to get a smile on your face, think about where you'd be without the blood of Jesus. 
Think about where we'd be today had He not died for us. Had it not been for the Son of God. Think about where we'd be. I know our streets are battered with riots. I know today that we've got a virus that's got everybody in a mess. I realize that things are troubled, but I tell you what, today I still stand redeemed, a child of the King, and nothing can separate me from the love of God. And I tell you, that's where worship comes from. It comes from looking up, for your redemption draweth nigh. Stop looking around so much. Stop worrying about the circumstances and get your eyes on the King of glory and realize soon and very soon we're going to see the King. Oh, I I don't mean to get too personal today, but I tell you, God's been helping me lately and God's been showing me things lately and I've been getting things right with not just God, but with my wife and we become empty nesters and we're having our second honeymoon now, it may make you sick, but it's good with me. I tell you what, I cannot get over. I was looking at her yesterday, and I was thinking, my mind just churning. It is unbelievable to me to believe she was gorgeous when I married her. She's more beautiful right now. She's just getting better with time. And, and I'm sorry, Michelle, that it's not happening both ways. But, but for better or worse, babe, that's just the way it is. And you know what the thought keeps coming in my mind? That, that I've got her, and, and here we are, man. We're having the time of our life. And kids, we love you. It's not because you're gone, but it is because you're gone. And, and, and we do love having you back at the house. But, but we're loving just, just being with each other. We've not ever known that. We got married and started having babies. But here's what I discovered. I discovered this. Think about how good God is that I have this beautiful wife. We're, we're in a second honeymoon phase that I hope lasts for the next 30, 40 years. Let me tell you what. I hope we live so long together that Steve never has a chance. That's what I hope. Never has a chance. He couldn't hold a candle to me anyway. But the fact of the matter is, I think about that. I think about my church family. I think about where I get to live, the beauty of these mountains. I think about my children. I think about the people they married who's become part of my family. And I have this one thought that keeps going through. All of this in heaven too? All of this in heaven too? Herb Revis said one time he was sitting in a parking lot listening to a preacher and drinking a milkshake. And that was the same thought God gave him. He said, I love that milkshake. He said, and I had a preacher on that was preaching heaven down. And he sat there and God gave him that thought. All of this in heaven too. Look around today at what you've got. Look around at what God's given us. And just remember, heaven's coming too. All of this in heaven too. Then God's proclamation. I've got to hurry. God interrogated him, but then he proclaimed something. Look with me in verse 13. Here's what he says. Bring no more vain oblations. Incense is an abomination to me. Maybe we need to, maybe we need to bring this to our day. Go ahead and insert in your mind what you think God would have said to 2020 church. Bring no more what? What are we doing that has kept us out of where we need to be? He said incense is an abomination. They'd like that because they'd think that'd make it better. What do we do to try to make worship better? But all it does was weary us. What have we tried to do to manufacture worship? He says this, your new moons and Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies, I cannot away with. Listen, I'm going to read it to you from the message. <laughs> this is awesome. This sounds like 2020. Quit your worship charades. I can't stand your trivial religious games. Listen to this, Baptist. Your monthly conferences. Your weekly Sabbaths. Special meetings, 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 meetings. I can't stand one more. Meetings for this and meetings for that. I hate them. You've worn me out. Listen, this is God talking to the church. You're wearing me out with your meetings. And the Baptist ought to say, Amen. I'm sick of your religion, religion, religion. While you go right on sinning. Listen now. 
When you put on your next prayer performance, I'll be looking the other way. No matter how long or loud or often you pray, I'll not be listening. Listen to what he says. I know it's old English here in verse 13. I cannot away with. I can't take it anymore. You know what God's telling us? I can't take it anymore. We have met, 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 met. Through the years, met, 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 met. We've had our conferences. And a lot of times our meetings is to just make sure, make sure that we're keeping everybody in line. Let's make sure we don't trust our leadership, so let's meet and make sure we got them under control. Or let's meet, 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 so that we can, uh, we can micromanage everything that's going on in the church. And you know what we've done? We've micromanaged God plumb out of the church. We can't even make decisions with, without, we don't pray about it. We just want to, to make sure that everything that goes down in those business meetings, there's some churches that have held to the bylaws more than they've held to the Bible. No wonder God's not there. You know what God said? You warned me out in them meetings. You warned me out just doing all this stuff. So let's ask ourselves, what do we think is unbearably repulsive to God? What do you think today is repulsive to him? Well, we might say hardcore crime is. We would say the exploitation of children has to be repulsive to God. I I would agree. What about the terrorist mayhem that's going on? That's repulsive. We would all say, I'll tell you what, that angers God. That is repulsive to a holy God. But it might not occur to us What the soul of God hates and is burdened and wearied by is the worship we've offered Him. If we're not repentant, if we come in and play games, if we go on, right on, living our lives just like He doesn't exist, and then we walk into church and all of a sudden flip the switch and we have a little worship time, you know? We go through our process and then we cut the lights off and we go right back to this world and we run right back to our old way of life and doing everything. Then we run right back in the next Sunday and we say, here we are, God. We love you, we love you, we love you. And then we run right back out. Try that in your marriage. Just give them one hour. Run in, do a little smooching, have a little meal. See you next week. But I love you more than you ever believe. I love you so much, I'd do anything for you. See you in a week. And that is if I don't have anything else that gets in line with that. Today we have to question ourselves. Do we want to hear God or not? John 10, 28 through 30, he said, My sheep hear my voice. What is God saying to us today? What's God saying to you through the pandemic? What's God been telling you lately? You have to answer that. It may not be the same for all of us. What is he trying to awaken you as an individual to? And he ain't done with me yet. He's wore me out. He's cutting a lot of the old callus off of me. What's he been doing to you? What's he teaching us about fear? What's he teaching us about faith? What's he trying to teach us about us trusting him? What's God trying to teach us as a church? What's he trying to say to us? Are we listening to him? This old golfer was standing in front of the first tee in a, it's a hazardous hole. It had water all around it. He's wondering if he should use his brand new ball. But he decides the hole's too dangerous, so he takes out an old ball. If I lose that ball, it won't bother me, he says. He placed that old ball on the tee, and then he heard a voice from above saying, Use the new ball. Frightened, he replaced the old ball with a new one and approached the tee. He, the voice said, You better take a practice swing. And with that, the golfer totally obeyed the voice. He stepped back and took a practice swing. A few minutes, he hears this. The voice rang out again and said, Use the old ball. (laughs) We need to be listening today. God knows you. You know why God talks to us? You know why God takes us to the woodshed? You know why he interrogates us? Because he wants what's best for us. He wants what's best for us. What's God saying to us? How does God feel about us right now? I don't know, but let's ask him. Have we been guilty of simply going through the motions? I have. 
I'll put my hand up first. I didn't do it every Sunday, but a lot of Sundays. And is your devotional time uh, just going through the motions? All right, everybody, test. If you did devotions this week, what's the one thing God showed you? Do you remember any of them? What did, what did he speak to you? Did you write it down? Can you tell us one thing? And you all know, there's heads bobbing. You know that's what you do. You listen for his voice, and he tells you. He tells you what he wants you to know. And then, when we close this text today, we've seen God's interrogation when he calls us in and says, what's your purpose? And we have to answer that. Then he makes a proclamation to us in these verses. Look at verse 14. Your new moon and your appointed feast my soul hates. You know what he's saying? You go through your services, your services, your services. He said, I'm weary to bear them. And in verse 15, when you spread forth your hands, watch this. When you spread forth your hands, I'll hide my eyes from you. Because I know it's not sincere. Listen, guys, we got to be careful this whole praise and worship thing. You've got to be careful because it becomes just a ritual. Your hands are not up because you're madly in love with God. It's just a process. You know, churches are doing that. We've got caught up in the process. And listen to what God's saying. I'm turning my head from that. I want your sincerity. Sing from your heart. Sing from your heart. Worship me from your heart. You ever notice that we get our hands up in music? But what if something struck a chord during preaching? I want to challenge you. Maybe every now and then during preaching something strikes a chord. Huh? It, it's not just music. Man, you can't give Dan all of it. Me and Mark want a little taste of that as well. How, it's not wrong to amen during a song. It's not wrong to shout during a song. It's not wrong to amen during preaching. Or say, thank you, God. Or to worship Him. He wants that out of your heart. Agree with it. But listen, if we do it just to do it, and let me tell you, churches have done that, practiced it for years. You go in and it starts and everybody just starts their little ritual. And God's saying, I can't take it anymore. Now He gives us a recommendation. So here we are, church. Here we are. Let's hear what God recommends to us. You ready? Verse 16, wash you. Let's repent. Clean up. Hey, Calvary Road, I'm just interested. How many of you want to clean this up? How many of you want to get it right? I do. And listen, not every Sunday's going to be the same. It's, it's, not, it's not something that's a performance. I know in the years as we've done these beautiful dramas, if you've been part of the drama, you, you get used to the timing of it. So you know when to come out. What are you doing in the meantime? Well, a lot of times we wasn't paying any attention to the beauty of what was going on in the pageant. We were sitting back there eating snacks and laughing, and then it was our time. So it was a process. You knew your cue. You knew the time to come out. The song would start. You would sing the song. You'd go back and change your outfit and do your thing. And so here's what I noticed, that through the years, the audience was enamored. They were seeing it for the first time. It was so fresh to them. And when the tomb scene would come up, and yes, many times we, we loved it, but I noticed something, that when the tomb scene would come up and, and, the, and the audience would shout, there would be a loud applause, we'd be sitting back there and we'd say, that's good. That's good. But we had seen it. We had rehearsed it. We had been through it, been through it, and been through it. And you know what we need from God today? Is we need to get right with God and let Him refresh our view of everything. To clean us up so we see it like we saw it for the very first time. Y'all remember when you got saved, how good it felt? The joy that was in you, and then the church got a hold of you. And they sucked all the joy out of you. And then you got put on a committee. And you saw real church in action. And you had meeting after meeting after meeting. And that person who just got 
fresh saved who the songs were sung the tears would stream and you'd be like glory glory and then you'd come to church and you'd sit there and during the church service you were thinking about what you'd talked about during that meeting during that meeting and we become part of the process and we know our cue we know when to stand up we know when to step out we know what we're supposed to do we know that during this song we're supposed to stand and during the message we're supposed to sit quietly and listen the devil has got us in a rich and we need to say oh God forgive us for being caught up in the rituals of these things we've lost sight of you we lost you in the process God get our eyes back on you that's his recommendation first to us is that we get washed up and then he tells us to cease to do evil look what the Bible says wash you make you clean put away the evil of your doings if it's wrong, stop doing it. Cease to do evil. And you say, well, I'm not evil. I know we like to rank it, don't we? But whatever it is that the Holy Spirit's telling you to cease doing, cease doing it. And then watch how fresh God gets. Learn to do well, verse 17. You see that? Learn to do well. How many of you know that's a process of learning? <laughs> you don't just do well. Any parent of a young child will say that's an amen truth. What they learn quickly is, is how to do wrong. We all have that sin nature in us. You have to teach them to do well. You have to teach manners. You don't have to teach lies. A lie will come natural. Manners don't come natural. You have to teach them. Learn to do well. God, what is it that's well? Shouldn't we ask that? What is well? Let's find that out from him. Seek judgment. Relieve. Listen, church. Relieve the oppressed. You know what will ignite us in our worship? You know what will ignite us as a church? When we continually and keep doing and go to the nth degree of relieving the oppressed. Just be in the hands and feet of Jesus. He desires for us to help the down and out, to stand up for the hurting, go to bat for the defenseless. That's what he's talking about in these verses. And then he says in verse 18, come now, come, let's reason together. You know, God loves us enough to have a conversation with us. Come now, church. Come now, folks. And I've been speaking to you because I love you. I took you out of church. I let that happen. I took every one of you and your families. I took you out of church. I'd like to reason with you. I'd like to, in the last of the last days, give you an opportunity to do a better job of what was so messed up. So let's reason together. You know God wants to do that with us this morning. He wants to talk to us. He wants to get our hearts ready. And He tells us, Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. You know what I'm hearing this morning? That, God, we admit this morning we've done it wrong. We've got caught up in a ritual. But, God, you say you love me. You say you'll forgive me. God, you've been telling me that I mean a lot to you. And I don't want to do it wrong anymore. I want my life not to be mechanical. I want it to be real. God's not pleased with the cliques and the holy huddles of church. We're not cooped up ones. We're the sent out ones. And he's saying your sins, though they be as scarlet they shall be as white as snow, though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. You know today what we've got? We've got a fresh start. God stopped everything. God has stopped everything, but now He says to us as a church, and this might be what we look like. I don't know. I don't know where we're headed, but this will be okay. It's going to be okay. God would rather have ten who are fully devoted as to have 10,000 just putting on a show. That's what he's after. He wants realness and authenticity. He promises us forgiveness. Two pals are sitting in a restaurant watching the 11 o'clock news. 
A report comes on about a man threatening to jump from the 20th floor of a downtown building. One friend turns to the other and says, I'll bet you 10 bucks the guy doesn't jump. It's a bet, agrees his buddy. A few minutes later, the man on the ledge jumps. So the loser hands his pal a $10 bill. He said, I can't take your money. I saw him jump earlier on the 6 o'clock news. Me too, say the other buddy. But I didn't think he'd do it again. See, God longs for us to learn from our mistakes. McKinnon, come back up here, would you? God wants you to know today that he loves you. And he's a forgiving God. Listen, he's a God of multiple chances. Aren't you glad his grace and his mercy is renewed every morning? Aren't you glad God's saying, okay, all right, all right. I'd admit I've not been pleased with what I've seen and heard. But I will forgive you. I'll give you a fresh start. June the 7th, 2020, I'm going to give you a brand new start. Those of you that are at home right now, talk to him. Come, let's reason together. While she sings this song this morning, again, remind you what God says. I love the words because a lot of us feel constantly defeated, but listen to what God says about you. You say, I'm loved. He does love you. And it's with an everlasting love. God today, yeah, he might not have been pleased, but he ain't going to throw us away. He's just loving enough to have took us all out of the building to get our attention. What a God that would love us that much. As we stand all over this building today, and here's what we're going to do. We're going to take care of the cleaning of the building. All right? You don't have to do that. The doors are going to be open. We'll open all these doors. You can leave. You don't have to touch nobody. You don't have to do any of that. Drop your offering if you've got one. Okay? But listen, we're going to go out of these doors and worship. Okay? We'll take care of the rest of this and get ready for that next service. But today... We've been honored to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. And listen, if we've learned anything in the last several weeks, we're not here because we have to be. We came here because we get to. We got to come to church today. For those of you that are home, you got to go to church online again. Worship in your house as we listen to these words. And if you know it, she won't be mad if you sing it with her. Let's listen to these great words this morning. If you need God, he says, come. Let's talk. Let's talk.
Sunday. Enjoy your family. Take this day that God designed for us. We have now worshipped. Right? We have now worshipped. And nothing would please God more than you to take the rest of this day and enjoy your family. What a beautiful day God's given us. And if your family says it's more enjoyable for you to go do something else, go do something else. Whatever you need to do. Give me about two or three volunteers. And uh, we'll take care of the rest of the building. We, we've we got sprayers now, and uh, we're going to make it as safe as we can. But if you're not scared of corona, hang out with me for a minute. We'll take care of this wipe down. rest of you, get out. Well, thanks for being with us in worship today. It is our heart's desire that through the Word and through this worship service today, God has spoken to your heart, and you desire to serve Him and to worship Him more than you ever have in your life. You know, if you've been watching today and you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, that is our greatest desire. If we can be a help to you, if we can uh, assist you in any way, please contact us at the information you see on the screen. We also want to thank those of you who watch us regularly. We greatly appreciate your prayer and support. Keep praying for us as we pray for you as we serve the Lord together.
strength.